Hey everyone, this is Dr. B from Steps to the Future, welcoming you to this week's College and Career Conversations with Dr. B. Now, if you've been following along and checking out the event page, you see that we have um, uh, a very special guest with us this evening that I am thrilled um, to have. So take some time, go grab your cup of water, your juice, whatever you have, and join us and come back here in 30 seconds and we'll see you then. So welcome back, everyone. Um, again, Dr. B here, College and Career Conversations with Dr. B. Now, you know, most of you know, if you've tuned in before, that I started um, this, this section known as Representation Matters um, after a conversation with my youngest son in regards to um, George Floyd's murder and other things that were going on in our country with racism. And we talked a lot about how it would be wonderful for young black and brown children to see um, people that look like them in a variety of careers. So that's what I've been working on for the past few months. And this evening, I am really thrilled to bring to you one of my favorite, favorite educators of all time, uh, Mr. Richard Martin, who recently retired from the East Providence um, School District as a social studies teacher. So let me just give you a little little intro, a really short intro, because Richard, you, you want to hear from him. You don't want to hear from me. <laughs> so Richard actually is retiring as a public school teacher. He's, he's spent many of those years in the East Providence um, School District. And in his last stint at East Providence High School, he was teaching AP government and Africana studies. Um, Richard, welcome. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very here. much. Thank you. So for those people who are joining in, make sure you throw in your comments. I want you to join in the conversation, especially if you're a townie. You know, this is this is this is for you also. So join into the conversation and let us know what your thoughts are. So Richard, 40 years. 40 years. How yeah, do you yeah. that's a lot of that's a lot of classroom time to reflect um, on? Yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, actually, it's it, it's for, forty two because I started in um, nineteen seventy nine. I was a long term sub in the Lincoln School System, teaching um, American history and three psychology courses as an elective. I had two psychology courses as an underclassman, and there was no book. It was an elective, and he just created it. He leaves to become a state trooper. And they hire me, and there I am working without a net. Scared oh, wow. to absolute death. <laughs> so 79 to, to now, and I never thought I would retire before Rod Stewart. But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so I actually remember meeting you before you started teaching in East Providence, and probably before you were teaching in Lincoln. I remember you from the opportunities industrialization from OIC. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. I remember you from OIC wow. way back when. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that is way back. Tremendous experience. Tremendous yes. experience. Uh, working with serious juvenile offenders. Yes. And we, we were either um, helping them get their GEDs or um, keeping them up in their classwork so they could uh, go back to their schools. And it was a wonderful experience, especially with discipline and running a classroom and teaching that population. I would never trade it because when I got to, to East Providence, I had discipline kind of in my bag, at least to start with, you know, that mo that that beginner's discipline that you think is good, but you'll still need work. But at least I had something. So, yeah. wow. That's yeah, that's way back. That That's way that's back. Way back. 
So here's something, and I know I, I had mentioned it before when we did one of these um, a while ago, and I was actually looking up the date, and I'm like, oh my God, that's been a while. I had the same yeah. shirt on, but I had to go change it. So <laughs> <laughs> I really did. My North Carolina blue shirt. I had oh my blue. goodness, that's so funny. <laughs> you know, I, rem I remember, um, you know, because kind of the East Providence, for, for people that aren't familiar, when we were, um, and I don't know if they still do it this way, but one of the things we had, one of our duties was corridor duty. So you always had a, a, a period where you had to, you know, work. <laughs> so my duty car, for, for corridor duty was to patrol the second floor um, girls room around room like 208 up in that area. And that was near your room. And I remember one of my absolute joys. I was so glad when I had duty and I was assigned there. I used to like to sit outside your classroom and listen to you teach. Oh, that's so nice. It was, um, so it was a combination of you teaching because you're a fantastic storyteller and you make history come alive in a way that not every history teacher does. <laughs> Thank you. But what I love the most was the relationship between you and your students, there was such a deep level of respect that was reciprocal that you don't always see between teachers and their students. And you would walk in the classroom and if it was uh, afternoon classroom, you would say, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And if students didn't respond back with a good afternoon, you would just very quietly repeat it. And then they would respond. You gotta say but something. It, but it was never responding like, oh, here he goes, the people rolling their eyes. Mm -hmm. They really, they really genuinely liked that interaction with you. And I think that's part of what, in my mind, you know made you an excellent teacher. Excellent Thank teacher. Thank you. Thank you. I just think that um, when I started the first day of school, I would, I would always say this, we're going to do this. And I said, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon. And I'd say, you're going to repeat after me. And they would. And then I would explain to them why. And I said, the reason why I do that is because um, I never liked it when teachers I had would say, you know, as soon as they work in, open your book to page, whatever, or take out your homework without any kind of a formalized greeting. So I always use that for two things. One, hello, how are you? And two, that's the sign that I've taken attendance and we're going to get down to business. And it was a, just, I thought it was a kind of a cool way to, to segue into what it is we were going to do. But by, how are you? Hello. And just that mm -hmm. simple thing started the, started that kind of respect that you said was reciprocal because it was, I respected them and they respected me. Yeah. Yeah, the, and like I said, that was so evident throughout throughout your teaching career. I remember one time, and I'm and I don't remember the exact circumstances, but I remember I was standing outside your door. I don't know if you you had a meeting or something, but they said, you know, just just stand here because Mr. Martin's going to be a few minutes late. So you might have had to, you were in a meeting or or whatever. And I remember the class of students. Um, probably half of the students were students that we would sometimes seeing room 119 <laughs> and, 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 other times. and for those of you um who aren't familiar with east providence high school 119 is the room that students would be sent to when they were misbehaving so they would have to go down to 119 and have to deal with the vice principal so i remember i'm standing there and and these kids you know i said oh my god half of these kids you know are regulars in 119 and the late bell was getting ready to ring. And one kid, I mean, he was breaking his neck. He was he, he was going to be in his seat before that bell rang. <laughs> and they came in and they sat down. And I remember saying, so I said, I said, look, because by that time I, I was in, I was in guidance. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to the students, I said, so look, I know, you know, some of you, I see you downstairs a lot, you know, getting in trouble and stuff like that. And I said, but I noticed when you're in Mr. Martin's class, you're different. You're different people. I said, why is that? And one kid said, he goes, there's no way I want to disrespect Mr. Martin. And I was like, wow. 
That's amazing. That that's pretty cool. was like that's pretty cool. For, for me, that and they all were in agreement that they didn't want to disappoint you. They didn't want to let you down. And I'm like, okay, this is this is more than social studies. <laughs> more than social studies. This is this is humans reacting, you know, with humans interacting with humans and. I, and I just always remember those kids saying that because they were dead serious. They were not playing around. They weren't joking around. Yeah. They felt that it it was their duty to make sure you knew that they respected you. Yeah, that's 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 really nice. Um, and I worked at that. You know, I worked really hard at that. And so I tell, you know, my young teacher friends or, or anybody who listen. It's I, the, and I you. I'm glad you used the word human because that's what I've been telling people. It's the human thing. Yeah. And and I think teachers need to be more human. Now you need to we need to have standards, rituals, rituals and routines. But the human touch. Good morning. Good afternoon. Right. Madam, uh, sir. You know now we have to be a little bit, a little bit more inclusive. But right. but that lets them know that they're a human in your eyes. And if you can start from there. Now you have something to build on. Now I can teach you something about history because I have your attention. Right. And, and, and if, and so as you learn later on about discipline, it's not always about raising your voice, yeah, okay. which you have to learn. Sometimes talking softer communicates even more than raising your voice. Right. And I had to learn that because you know, when you're young, you start out raising your voice, then you realize, <laughs> especially in middle school, that's what they want. So yes. <laughs> find another way. So now let me just bring the tone down mm -hmm. and then get me my father's tone of voice, right? Which yes. scared me straight. And then, <laughs> or I would just go on these soliloquies where, you know, I, I know they didn't understand what I was saying, but they could tell by the tone. Yeah, okay, I should probably, I should probably stop. And I, right. I took that from a teacher that I had when I was at, at um, the high school, Mrs. Harrower, I'll never forget it. She okay. taught English and she taught um, mythology. And I took both classes and she had this little Prince, kind of Prince Valiant haircut yes. and I loved her. And I loved the way, that's what she would do. And I, she did it to a friend of mine and he was trying to go back with it. And he was, she's saying stuff and I know he couldn't understand what he was, she was saying because <laughs> I couldn't understand it. But I knew the tone wasn't good. Right. So I said, huh, let me revise my discipline I, that's what I took from her. Just okay. kind of, I'm going to yeah. go on. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to talk kind of over here and tell you I'm a high wire act and it takes me all day to calm down. And I'm trying not to get high wire. But if you would just stop, then I wouldn't have to be high, high wire. And while I'm doing this, the, the posture is getting smaller. And then I call on you for the next question so you know it's not personal. Right. Right. That is so good. Arlene Harrower. Oh my goodness, that I remember Arlene, my first year teaching at EP. Tremendous. She was, she was a force to be reckoned with. And she was real she, small, little, little you know, yes. short, but dynamic. Yes, she yeah. was. And it wasn't yes, kind of was. waving your arms dynamic, it was just dynamic, like right here. Right. Mm. So, Richard, I've been, you know, I've been reading, you know, we're always reading. Uh, but really looking at the state of education and the shortage of teachers and and we know the shortage of um, black and brown teachers in the classroom. Yes. So so earlier today, I was reading an article um, from Education Week where the secretary of Ed education, Cordona, was talking about um, some of his strategies that he wants to put in place to um, increase diversity in the classroom and just increase teachers, because one of the things I've noticed in working with colleges and visiting colleges is that some education programs are really hurting. They're not getting the number of students going into education that they had before. And, you know, one of the things he said is increase teacher pay. Yes. You know, that that's that's an important thing. I remember my getting my first paycheck. And I remember I was actually in the. Oh, in our ladies room, we had this little you know, outside room that you could go into first. And I remember I was in there with Lynn Rakatansky, who was a math teacher. And Lynn and I started at EP the same year. And I remember looking at the my check and I'm like, Lynn, did they pay us for two? Is this for two weeks? <laughs> Is this it? <laughs> did somebody forget the other week that we worked here? Right. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. And that's a problem. That's, yes. that's a problem because 
when we talk about the uh, looking for the best and the brightest mm -hmm. and the best and the brightest have a choice. The choice is when they come out of school, they're carrying tremendous debt. Um, the choice is I can start teaching at 45,000 or I can start at 60 or 70 or 80, depending on what the job is. Um, and that's what we're up against. And so we have to pay people because if we don't pay people, um, you know, they have to make these student, these astronomical student loan payments. Yeah. They have to find a place to live. They have to have reliable transportation. So that's, that's the first thing, but you're right. There's a crisis coming. There's a crisis coming because the last two years have beaten people down. Yes. It has beaten people down because we're asking people to, in the face of all this, try to maintain some semblance of normalcy. And then even now that we're back in person, there's still all of the accompanying stresses that go with that. Um, and in, in terms of teachers of color, um, it, it's even more because young, young people of color aren't even going into the field. I was on a commission yeah. with um, Representative Greg Amore. Um, It was about retaining and recruiting and retaining teachers of color. And we had um, one of the... Um, department chairs from Rhode Island College come and testify. And she talked about the, the numbers are down. The numbers are down. And then the way we accept people with these arbitrary cut scores for tests, yeah. you know, and, and her story was really compelling because she was somebody like me who, if it was dependent on a standardized test, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today because I wouldn't have been a teacher. So you have to look beyond the standardized test to look at the, the to look at the person and say, okay, we can work with, with that part of it but there's the i call the it there's the it mm -hmm. and you know because you've had student teachers and you've seen people. as soon as you see somebody you know yes right. no with work maybe you can see it and that's what we have to do and we have to also go into these schools high schools and try to encourage young people to to teach and the problem with that is they're still in it so they have a hard time envisioning themselves mm. in front of the room because they're still, they're still students and they see the way the classes work and they go, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. But you can always, I shouldn't say always, but when you find someone who's thinking about it, you have to just keep planting those seeds. Right. Right. That is so true. So for people who are just joining us, we're here with uh, Mr. Richard Martin, who recently retired from the East Providence Public Schools after uh, 40 years in the social studies department. Um, teacher extraordinaire, one of one of my personal heroes. Um, so join in the conversations, especially if you're from EP, if you're here representing Townie Pride, we want you to join in the conversation. And uh, if you're not watching this live and you're watching it on the replay, you can still join in the conversation. Sure. Um, Richard, you know, when you talked about, when you were talking about the quality. So in this same article, they were talking about um, some of the alternative programs that are around to help teachers um, become certified. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. talked about, you know, just what you said, is this somebody who isn't quite there maybe with the scores or something else, but we know that they can get in the classroom. Cause I can't tell you the number of times somebody would say to me, Oh, put me in that classroom. I'll make those kids behave. And I'm, and I just roll my eyes. I'm like, yeah, yeah okay guy. Right. That's well, not going to happen. No. And you, you'd be fired the next, you'd be fired the next week. So like, That's let's right. stop it. That's let's right. stop it. It's, it's a nuanced kind of, of thing, it right? Is. You can't be the heavy disciplinarian because you're working with adolescents. And every time, and, and whenever you choose that route to come this way, that only leaves them one way to go. And they're going to come back because that's what they do. And so there's a nuance to it that most people don't get. You know, they think because they had teachers, they could be a teacher. But well, it's not that easy. It is. It is it, it, you know, I remember, you know, I remember my um, my student teaching years. So I. I went back to student teach at the for the high school from where I graduated, Central High School mm -hmm. in Providence, Rhode Island. Yay! Go, Absolutely. go Knights! Yeah. And I remember um, my supervising teacher was not happy that I wanted to go to Central. He actually wanted me to go to Cranston West. And I'm like, mm -mm, not going there. Um, I said, I can live at home and walk to Central. So yeah, like, that's, that's great. great. Yeah. yeah. And I remember he came in one day to observe me. 
And to me, the kids weren't being any different than they were any other day. But, you know, you know, kids can be a little, Absolutely. you know, they got a guest in the room. They're mm -hmm. supposed to be taking a test. So they're going to. And I just did, you know, what? And afterwards, he said, how did you do that? I said, do what? He goes, you kept them under control. And I said, well, it wasn't control. I said, Ooh. we have a relationship. Ooh, yeah, that's a bad word, control. I that's said, we have a relationship. So they know how far they can push. But I also know them as people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who I talk to about stuff other than social studies. And I said, and I learned that from my 11th grade history teacher mm -hmm. with the way he conducted class. You know, it's mm -hmm. funny when you think about the people who came before you, who you were watching them really close and learning from them. And then yeah. you realize that you took a lot of those lessons with you when you went into um went into the classroom. Absolutely. 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 Um, last week, there was a retirement um, for the superintendent, the outgoing superintendent. So I went. Um, she's been very kind to me and it was and it was a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful event. And I see Jack Resendez. Oh, right. my goodness. OK, so for those of you who don't know, um, he was a middle school. First of all, he was a teacher. Uh, he was my um, ninth grade civics teacher. He was one of the first people that showed me that this could be possible. This this teaching could be possible, but he made me like civics. So I was always social studies minded. So I see him at the event and come to find out the superintendent and his wife and he were really close friends. So I see him and I, I wait until the event is over and I go right over to him. And I take his hand, I shake his hand and I said, I did it. I did it. I'm leaving as passionate as and as excited as I came in. And mm -hmm. and Dr. B, I can hardly get the words out. I'm filling up. I can yeah. hardly get the words out. And I'm trying to explain to him how much he meant to me. Right. And he said, we go back a long way. Yes, you were my teacher at Central. And I, I said, you know, um, you're like my educational father. And um the kind of building we had, we had like shared classrooms mm -hmm. with a petition. And if you had to go to the men's room or ladies room, you're supposed to ask the teacher next to you, could you just watch my class? Well, you're young. You don't do that. You go to you sneak out. You go to the lab. You come back. He's sitting right in your chair <laughs> and you just do the, the, the dad thing. You just, oh, my God. So I tell him that story and, and we laugh. <laughs> and he said to me, he said to me, I knew character when i saw it uh, whoa yeah whoa. like when your dad says that it's just yeah. like oh my god and coming so, from jack resendez oh my god so i <laughs> hug him right and so and i always i don't i should know her name and i really don't but i always call her his good lady wife it's mr resendez and your good lady wife so she, oh, she gives me a hug and i'm like oh thank you so much so i pull it together I turn, I take literally three steps and I see this woman coming toward me. And she looks kind of familiar, but I did my teacher thing. How are you? So I had her two children. They're now rising juniors at URI. Oh. And she said to me, I just wanted to come and say hi to you. And I said, how are they doing? And she was telling me how they're doing. And she said to me, you're the standard in our house. I'm like what? You're the standard in our house. When they first went to college, um, I guess the professor must have asked them about their high school experience. And they were, Mr. Martin, and Mr. Martin used to say, and Mr. Martin used to do. And so every time they get a new professor each semester, I guess their mom must say, how oh, are they? They're good. Yeah, they're good. They know Mr. Martin. <laughs> so she's telling me this. I tell her the Jack Rizendi story. We both start filling up. And it's like, okay, we have to go because if we don't, we'll just be a puddle of tears. So thank <laughs> you and tell them that I give them my regards. And it was just perfect timing. I'd go from Jack, who's helped me start, to there, to this mother, who kind of, I had them two years ago, up to help mm -hmm. me end. Full circle. Circle, yes. Full circle. I came home, I'm telling the missus, I can't get through the story. I yeah. can't get through the story. I'm trying not to cry, getting through the story. So I tell my students, the last day I had them, uh, Thursday, at the end of the exam, I'll see them again on um, Wednesday at Juniors. I'm telling them the story, mm -hmm. right? And there's a girl in the back who's crying. I go, <laughs> I still got it. 
I can still make them cry or make them laugh. What a good way to go out. What a great way to go out. So Tim Finnegan has joined us from Rhode Island. Hey, Tim, how are you doing? So I know Tim. Tim was actually in my career information class for school counselors at Providence College. Mm. And he is at LaSalle. So um, thank you, That's Tim, for joining story. us. And as, as Tim said, fostering relationships is a skill and a gift. It is. It, it is. really it is. is. And, and it's the foundation of everything you do. Because if you want to get students interested in something that they're not ordinarily interested in, mm -hmm. it, you have to form a relationship. And then you tell them it. why this is important. And then you have to sell it. So I always taught like my life depended on it. And I always taught like this is going to be the most important thing you're going to hear all day long. Maybe it wasn't, but I'm going to sell it like it was. Um, and, and I have students who will see me to this day and say, I remember you said this or I remember you said that. And mm -hmm. I saw a student today, a former student today. Um, I was at a wake and he comes up to me, shakes my hand. And he said, um, you know, you were the best teacher I ever had in my life. And I'm like, no, no, stop. No, you were. And you made me care about things. You made me look at things differently. Yeah. How do you, I mean, what do you say to that? Just, thank you. And, and, and it's wonderful. I know. That is like, that is like so important because sometimes I don't know if, if the teachers realize how closely students are watching them. Ooh. Um, and I'll never forget, I think I had, I had just left the classroom and had become, a, um, a counselor at the high school. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was waiting after school for a school improvement team meeting to start. And I was, you know, standing there talking with some other teachers and, and this young woman walked up to me who, you know, she, uh, black female, and mm -hmm. she was maybe, oh, I don't know. I mean, she was a young adult mm -hmm. and. She said, "Hey, hi, Mrs. Wilkerson." I said, "Hey, how are you? You know, you don't you don't remember the kids, oh, yeah. the kids over the years." Oh yeah. <laughs> and and she said to me, um, "You don't remember me, do you?" And I'm like, "No." I said, "But you look familiar." Mm -hmm. She said, "Well, you were so at so at Martin Junior High, we had um, remember when we used to have repeat period?" Oh yeah, yeah. So There's a novel repeat. concept. Right. So this was a repeat period. And, and sometimes you had kids from other grades or whatever. And she said, I remember I had you um, for one of those classes. And she said, and I was in a really bad place, headspace at that time. And she said, um, where I was thinking about quitting school. And I remember she was only a, at that time, I think she said she was an eighth grader. So I said, you were quitting. Think about quitting school. She goes, yeah, it just wasn't working and nothing was going right in school. She said, but whenever I had you, you just treated me like a person. You just treated me like a human. And she said, I used to look forward to knowing that I might only have you maybe two or three times a week, but I was going to have you. And she cool. said, and I'm here now she said, um, registering my young son for, for some program that was going on at the high school. And she said, and I wouldn't have made it if she goes, you turned me around and you didn't even know it. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, I don't remember this poor girl's name. And she's telling me this, but it's, it's those, those are the things, the intangible things that make teaching like the, it. to me, it, it's, 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 it says it all. It's the most valuable, precious priceless profession in the world because i don't it. think they could ever pay you enough money right to do right it. it's not the money it's the lifelong memories that they have of you right so uh, along those lines uh there was a, a student who uh, uh had just transferred to martin and he was in house like that study hall kind of thing mm -hmm. so um he's reading a comic book and i forget what comic might have been batman so i'm like oh you like batman yeah, I like Batman. Well, I like Daredevil. Daredevil's my man. So we sat down and talked about comic books. And so I see him, I've seen him intermittently. And I saw him at this comic book store I go to in Seacott, Massachusetts. And he tells that story to the gentleman who's at the register, who owns, co-owns the store. And he still to this day says the same thing. He said, you reached out and made me feel comfortable when I was in an uncomfortable situation. And I said, it was just a human thing. Right. And those human things that 
we take for granted, you know, should be part of what all of us as teachers do. Find ways to be human. You know, talk about music you like, right? Talk about mm -hmm. books you read. Um, you like that? Yeah, I like that band. It, really? You like that? Yeah. I went to go see him three times. You saw Queen three times? Yeah. And then, <laughs> oh, because, it, you know, it might not have been cool in your neighborhood to like this, but I don't care. And so now right. you find kids who, like, get that confidence to like what they like instead mm -hmm. of, you know, well, I'm going to, like, go along to get along. No. The sooner you can be an individual and express yourself, the better it is. The better it yeah. is. It really is. And, and that always worked. Music, comics always worked for me. Yeah, that is so true. That is so true. And that's that's why I worry sometimes when I hear about, you know, the alternate programs or programs that are people are coming in it for two years and then they're going to leave because they're oh, just yeah. using it as a stepping stone. Yep. Yeah, teaching is. I mean, e either you love it or you hate it. You can't sure. come in and just say, I'm just going to do this. I remember my first. Oh, my God. My first year at EP. Lord, I, I, I remember telling um, Billy Flanagan, Billy Flanagan and I started the same year in the in the social studies department at East Providence High School. And I said, Billy, I don't think I'm coming back after this year. This is nothing like student teaching. That's right. they, didn't tell, they didn't tell us all this other stuff that was going to go on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these kids, these high school kids. Oh, my God. I, oh, my God. And I remember I said, you know, if I make it to whatever. And then I remember one another, you know, years passed and it's like five years later and we're we're still talking about school. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, guess I made it. But it takes yes. it it takes time. You you love it, but it's really developing those relationships. And yeah. like you said, you can't teach history, you can't teach social studies, math, or anything else until they know that you care about them. That's right. That's right. Because the rest of it just sounds like noise. Right. Um, but, but that's, so two things you said, really important. One, these programs where you come in, first of all, it's like a two year commitment and then they put you in high need areas. Yes. Okay, that's fair, right? So they put mm -hmm. you in high need areas, then you leave because you've got that on your resume and you go do something else. But to the second point, that first year you, you teach is the hardest year of your life, mm -hmm. period, period. Now you can go five years and then a new, a new prep, yeah. the hardest year of your life and that, so my first when i got to the high school i had been teaching for 13 12 13 years taught civics i get to the high school and now i'm teaching um honors u.s history it's the hardest year of my life i'm there till four o'clock mm -hmm. co i'd come home i'd eat i'd prep till 10 and i taught history like all my life but you want it to be um challenging and you're making up all your materials there was no internet where you could go and buy like something from teachers for teachers by teachers or whatever it is. You had to make yeah. everything up. Uh, it's, it was just really hard. And the second part of that is the first five years, like you said, you get to five years while well, I'm still here. Right. But then sometimes you think you've got it all and you mm -hmm. know it all. And yeah. then something happens. So I use the roller coaster analogy, right? The first five years, even 10 years, it's like the beginning of the roller coaster. I can see the whole park and then comes the rest of the ride. Yeah. And so that first 10 years or five years when you think you got it sussed and then you, you get to 10, you go, whoa, I know way more than I knew at five. 15, I knew way more than I knew at 10. Okay. 40, I knew way more than I did at 30. And I thought I had it pretty good, figured out pretty good at 30. Mm -hmm. You're always learning. You're always yes. learning. And, and I think for, for people who go into administration, I think you've got to teach 15 or 20 years before you go to administration because that's when you just get the feel of what it is. You go into administration after five, you know, not to yeah. go after administrators, but gee, that's pretty dangerous to me. I know. I know. I, I agree with you on that. So, hey, folks, we're here with Mr. Richard Martin, uh, recently retired from East Providence School District in the social studies department. So please make sure you join in the conversation, especially if you're out there in um, Townie Pride land, we'd like to hear from you. Um, don't we, you know, let this be more than a dialogue. You know, I'm sure people have um, opinions out there or comments they want to make. Um, questions. So, yeah. questions, so join in the conversation. I, I know when you talked about the lifelong learning, I feel like there's so much I'm learning now that I said, ah, 
I wish I could go back in time and teach this to my students that I had in those history classes, because I've learned information that I wasn't taught yes. and didn't know that it even existed to even go look for the resources to have those conversations with them. And exactly. sometimes I feel like, oh man, I said, you know, did I let my kids down because there's this information that I'm finding out? But then I'm like, what? I didn't ever knew this. Right. They didn't. I have a degree in history. That's right. I never learned this. That's right. Never That's knew right. about this book. Never knew about this author. And so I find myself now as a sponge, like, you know, reading everything and, and say, oh my God, oh my God. And then you're like telling somebody and like, I, I don't know, I was talking to my husband one day and he looked at me and said, oh, he goes, you're not in the classroom. <laughs> you're not in the classroom. So, so stop with that teacher voice telling me the story. You know, like, oh, but somebody, the I said, the dogs and cats don't want to listen. So, yeah. so you're it. <laughs> you're it. You're it. That's, you're the, it. that's going to be the hardest thing uh, yes. because this will be the first time in really the whole of my life that I will not have uh, an audience and I will not have a platform. Mm -hmm. And so the only one I'll be able to teach is the missus, and she's heard all this before. <laughs> so it's like, no, but it's, it, it is interesting, but I'm like, I can't. I can't put it through that because, like, so that's that's what I'm going to miss yeah. uh, the most is, is the ability to explain something to somebody um, in a way that they, that it clicks, yeah. you know? This is very kind. Thank you. That's very, very Yeah, good. This, this was so very nice. Um, our audience member. Thank you so much. Um, it's 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 so nice to, uh, I don't know. I can't imagine for me another profession other than maybe being a librarian. Mm. Maybe maybe being a librarian, but, but teaching. I knew when I was 12 years old that I was going to be a teacher. I knew it. Um, I was the kid in the neighborhood that would babysit everybody else's um, young, everybody else's siblings because they didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But that I used to make them play school. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So there you go. I don't know if I don't know if I was a fun babysitter because they had to play school. <laughs> they came home, they but they passed the test. <laughs> they sure did. They sure did. That's great. That's um, great. So we have a great question here from oh, um, from Debelina Chatterjee. She said. Um, Great conversation. So she has a question for you. How do we encourage young folks to be teachers? Most often they are being told that it is a profession that does not pay well. Um, if if pay is your be all and end all, that's absolutely true. It doesn't pay well, but it's so much more rewarding than pay. Now it pays you enough. I mean, I, mean, I have a really, I have a nice house. We eat uh, healthy food. We have reliable transportation. Um, you know, we sent my daughter to, to school, um, but it's more than, than pay. I think the way that we get them to be, to think about teaching is to, to talk about the things that aren't about money. It's about the light in someone's eyes where you explain something. It's the light in their eyes when they get something. Um, and that's really really the fun stuff. The other stuff, it's hard work, but I think if we get students to understand that it's incredibly rewarding um, to do this, that might do it. In fact, I have somebody now who's in, uh, I have now he's a junior. So another teacher, actually the department chair who also has this student um, said that he's kind of made these overtures about teaching. And so for the, and his, his last name is Martin. And so for the last two weeks, I've been calling him Mr. Martin. <laughs> and I said, so Mr. Martin, what do you think? So we're having a discussion. So Mr. Martin, what do you think? We think. And I said to him the, the other the last day I had, well, the last day of our class, I said, um, you know, I've been I've been trying to do this, but just think if you teach, they'll call you Mr. Martin. Mm. And he's and he said to me that last day, I'm thinking I'm gonna be a teacher. If I'm gonna be a teacher, will you come back and see me? Yeah, absolutely. Oh absolutely. Cool. So I'm going to give him my email and um, and hopefully he stays in touch. But that's the I think the key is it pays you enough if you're in it long enough. Right. It pays you enough, but it's so much more than than salary. It's the it's the life in your case some lifelong relationships that yeah. you've had, and um, in my case I think those those you see them they're everywhere. 
The students they are. are. Students are. And yeah. so the other day I was in the market and I'm getting bananas and I hear, that's Mr. Mine. <laughs> so I turn <laughs> and I don't know who it is. Oh, hi, how are you? And he said to me, are you still teaching? I'm retiring this year. Really? Oh, well, congratulations. You deserve it. Wow. Wow. That's nice. Wow. You know, which always beats the alternative. Mr. Mott, what? But it, but it's, it's, it, I told you this before the first time we did this, right? Um, you knew you wanted to be a teacher at, mm -hmm. um, oh, wait a minute now. I know. It's got a what about long you? Right there. There. Wow. Wow. Oh, listen to that, Mr. Martin. I recently wrote about you in my graduate program. Whoa. Wow. Whoa. That is, thank you. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh Representation God. truly matters. That is, that's fantastic. See, that's, this is the invisible. That's it. Payback. That's this, it. This is it. That's it. This is it. When, when you find out down the line in some kind of form, that you impacted someone that, you know, you know you're out there doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know you're walking in your purpose. But to have a student let you know that, that is like, so thankful. It's that's, the best pay. that's the pay. That's, that's the best it. pay in the world. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And and to your point, you said they were, they were watching you. They are recording. Like, if you talk to your, two, your sons about a trip you guys went on when they were like, 13 and 10 and 11, they'll remember. You know why? Because all they were doing is sit in the car and recording, right? We were like, is the car going to get us there? Do we have enough money for the hotel? We're thinking about all this other stuff. They're just watching. And that's what our students do. They just watch you. You don't think, even the ones who don't, you don't think are watching you. They're watching you. Look, we're there 180 days, mm -hmm. right? And we say trillions of words, trillions of words. And some days there's going to be something you say, that snaps them out of whatever it is for that one moment and gets them to think about something. And then maybe they go back to what they were doing because there's a lot of stuff hitting them. But for that moment, there was something that, a chord that you struck. And that chord may manifest itself then or like this like this comment manifests itself later. And, and how do you... How can, how can you not? It's glorious. It's just, that's right. all I can say. That's all I can it say. It is. It what? is. It, it is. You just, I don't know. And I and I love, Desi, that you say, you know, representation truly matters. Oh. Because, you know, I, I know, like, for me personally, I didn't have my first Black teacher until I was in the seventh grade. And I knew before then that I wanted to be a teacher because I just love school. Mm. You know, that, for me, that was a great place. It was a safe place. It was comfortable to be in a classroom. But to walk into that seventh grade English room and see Miss, Miss Judith Smith, oh, I, I was that. like, oh my God, this, this could be me in, fr in, you know, in front of my classroom. And, mm -hmm. and from then on, it was just like, yep, I know I got this because she just taught us English for the whole year. So I know I didn't know what I was going to teach at that point, but I knew I was going to be a teacher. I knew I was going to be an educator. Yeah, the missus had had a a, um, a black woman teach, and sometimes we talk about teach, and she still talks about her. Yeah. Because again, you saw somebody who you went, wow, looks like a looks like me, and dresses fantastically and yeah. carries themselves fantastically yeah. and opens up the door to potential, right? Yes. So when you said you knew you wanted to be a teacher at twelve, um, I didn't. I wanted to be an astronaut, um, okay. and then you know, the whole spin in and all that. And then um, I, there were no black astronauts. So subconsciously, I must've thought, maybe I can't do this because I don't see anybody who is. Right. So I always wanted to be a star and I wasn't quite sure how to do that. Um, I didn't know what that meant. I can't sing. Well, I, I don't think I can sing, but I'll sing in front of my class all the time. <laughs> um, I wasn't afraid of a crowd. I'm, I'm shy in most one-on-one -on -one situations, but in front of a crowd, I'm fine. I said, how can I do this? How can I be the person whose albums I looked at instead of going to class at university? How can I do that? And it hit me. Okay, teach, teach. Mm -hmm. And my parents who were footing the bill never said, you're going to go to the family business. There was never that pressure. The pressure, was, the understanding was you're always going to go to school. And then when you found something, go and do it. And so once I found this, 
and I could bring those aspirations, you know, that motivated me at the time to do this. So I created this Mr. Martin character and, and it's, he is a character and it allowed <laughs> me to go into middle school, right. And be able to survive middle school because middle school is, a, you know, all over the place. And, you know, if you had odd socks on, look at your socks or your haircut wasn't right that day. And you can't say to somebody, well, look at your haircut. So you had to find ways to deflect. And yeah. so, um, oh, I'll get to that. Good question. And um, <laughs> so I created this character who wouldn't be personally hurt by the stuff that middle schoolers did. And then yeah. I just kind of evolved it over time so that it's it's here. And I tell my young teacher friends, especially one, his name is John Turbin, and hopefully he's watching this or we'll watch <laughs> I tell him, when your life exceeds your dreams mm. and my life has exceeded my dreams, teaching has allowed me to be in my own head as big as any star playing in a 70,000 seat auditorium or stadium. That's me. I'm, I'm to the, to the crowd. And the missus came in one day to bring my um, shoes because it was snow and I forgot them and I was moaning and she comes in and when she was leaving, she just says, you're so loud. I said, because I'm teaching to the back row, man. <laughs> I'm going to be so loud. You have to listen. And right. that's, that's the teacher voice. Um, we get to this question, who inspired me to be a teacher? One, Jack Rezendis, who I had um, as, uh, as um, in the ninth grade. Um, Eddie Cronin, who taught history. Um, and uh, Bobby Fonts. Mm. Bobby Fonts used to sit on his desk, and I sat right in the front and just went. No book, just went. And I loved every minute of it. Um, the other part that I, I told Jack Rezendis was, um, I remember there was a teacher I had who was really good. And then um, years later, some other students had him at the end. And they said it just wasn't good because he had just, he just was exhausted. And when I heard that story early on in my teaching career, I promised myself that wasn't going to be me. And that's one of the things I told um Mr. Rezendis, I said, you know, I made it and, and I never, I promised myself, I swore to God, I would never be that teacher who went out bitter. And um, I think what other people don't realize too is teaching keeps you young. Yeah, Anytime well, you're surrounded yeah. by young people all day, it keeps you young. And that's what's happened to me. It, it has kept me young without a doubt. Without that a doubt. is, that is so true. I, you know, you know, so, so I, so I do this, do this business as a college counselor and you know, I'm, I'm a solopreneur, so I'm here by myself. But since 2019, January 2019, I've been the college counselor at a Montessori school in Raleigh. And then we had the pandemic, so everything was Zoom. Mm -hmm. But this year when school started, I told myself I said, I need to be on campus at least once a week mm -hmm. because I just needed to be around the kids. Yes. And, and like you said, they keep you young because they're teaching you things that, you know, when I always ask them, well, What's your favorite music? What show mm -hmm. are you watching? And they're telling me about the music. And I'm like, well, who is that? And then, of course, they laugh because mm -hmm. they're like, you don't know who that is. Yeah. So, or really, you know, so then they would go to their class and I'd get online and say, okay, let me, let me, let me figure yeah, out who that see. is. Yeah. Let me put on my headphones and listen to the music a little bit so I can have this conversation yes. with them. Yes. But what they do, and, you know, and the, no, 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 Dr. B, you don't want to say that. that that's not, you can't say that anymore. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's outdated. Okay, thank you. Really? No. Wow, I was just getting used to that too. I know. I just thought. <laughs> but that's I absolutely really true. Mastered it. <laughs> yep, that's absolutely true. And and because their window, like I always tell them, your window of opportunity is wide open. You've got right. the whole world in front of you. And watching kids realize that they do have the whole world in front of them, they have some skills. They have some information right. that they can now go out and kind of figure it out it is wonderful. It right. Is. And I would always contrast that by saying, so my window's closing. My window's closing because I've done all that. And being around you with a window that's wide open is so joyful. There's a joy in watching kids, especially high school. Loved middle school, but I, I it was like it was time. But once you go to high school and then go to graduation and uh, watch them walk across the stage, yeah. and then they want to take pictures with you. Yeah. And it, and you just go, yeah, look at them go. Look at them fly. Yeah. It's just wonderful. It's and just that, 
And that never goes away. So, no, so I get to, you know, so that a lot of the students I work with now, you know, they're high school age, but I told them, I said, you know, I'm not trying to stalk you or anything, but once you go to college, I yes. still, you know, I want to stay in touch if you're mm -hmm. okay with it. Mm -hmm. So one of my, so, you know, I've had a few, few people that graduated from college this year and um, one young man, oh my God, you know, we, we stayed in touch and, you know, we converse on LinkedIn every now and then. Mm -hmm. So he just graduated from the University of Michigan. He's, a, he's got a job as a software engineer with Microsoft in the state of Washington. I am like, I said, okay, like, I feel like the proud, you know, auntie is something because- oh, yeah, because you know, I worked with him for two years, and we were looking at those essays and filling out those applications, and you know, talking about the transition to college and what have you. Another young man is in his second year at Wake Forest. We talked last week. Mm -hmm. First year for him wasn't that great because it was COVID, so he's taking yes. yeah. in the classroom. Yeah, but this year, you know, he's he's the community chair of a, um, a student organization. He's doing intern. He was telling me about the research and internship that he's doing with one of the professors. Wow. He's, he's actually on campus this summer because he was fortunate enough. Well, not fortunate. He earned it. Um, he has a full ride scholarship hmm. to Wake Forest. So he's there this summer doing um, doing research. And nice. then he told me in the spring he's going in the spring semester of next year. He's going to Chile to do some more research. I'm like, oh, man, you know, and seeing, fantastic. seeing that, and I just love it. I just love seeing that, be, you know, seeing them become adults and coming into their own. Yes, it's fantastic. Yes. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. it. Absolutely because great. You, you appreciate this. So um, because I was teaching AP government and the majority of the kids were freshmen, mm. you're the first voice they hear. And then some of them would come back and take uh, Africana and it'd be the last voice they hear. So watching them go as coming in as freshmen, you know, like, oh, my God, it's AP government, this guy. Ooh. And then working through that and then having them come back is yeah. spectacular. So I have this student who um, I had him as a freshman in AP government. Tremendous student, tremendous student. So this year uh, he's a junior and he's taken uh, Africana 200. So. Uh, about three weeks to a month ago, my department chair says to me, can you come in and do some curriculum work? Um, yeah, all right, on, on a day that I wasn't in the building. So I come in and I go to the room where it was gonna be and the shade is down and I'm like, all right, whatever. So I knock on the door, I open the door. There's like 40 kids in there oh. and they have like all have some kind of superhero mask on. <laughs> and they all, there's like Batman and Black Panther and Captain America. One of the teachers that decorated the room. And so this young man organized, we have a what you need block. So they can, if if they need catching up, they can catch up. If they want to go do something to just chill, they can. It's great. So he organized these Google invites, Google form invites oh. to coordinate these kids from different areas of the building to come in to do this retirement thing. They had cake, oh. they were playing music. It just was, so I sing Queen Somebody to Love like I did when they were freshmen and they <laughs> loved it. And so at the end of the, near the end, he goes to this closet and he comes out with this wrapped package. And he says, excuse the wrapping. And I'm like, what? no, please. So I open it up. It's an Italian pressing of, uh, older Rod Stewart album, right? And he said, well, but it's got, but it's got a booklet in it. Oh, oh okay. Uh -huh. So then there's another album by a band called Japan that I told him I liked literally weeks before this, right? Because we always talk about music. In yeah. fact, we like much of the same music. It's, it's amazing. I said to him, if we were time travelers and I was like, I don't know, 50 years younger and you would stay where you are, we'd be good friends. And so he gives me this thing and it was, it was a, a release and the red vinyl, a press. And I said, I was literally, last year when this came out, seconds away from buying it because it's one of my favorite bands and I was going to buy it. Now, weeks before that, he had said to me he got a job at Cellos. Mm. And I said, oh, the missus is always talking about Cellos clam cakes. And I said, well, now that I know I've got an in. So he said, oh, yeah, you should come by. I'll make you a batch of clam cakes. So we laughed. So on my way home, I'm realizing the, the enormity of this. So he's working at cellos, mm. buys these two LPs of his own money, 
Uh, does this organization thing invites kids to this thing for me yeah i was like oh my god so i pulled it so i was just sitting back watching it and so the, some kids at a table in front of me is come on mr mind join us join us I said, i'm just watching it i'm just enjoying it and then she says yeah but we love you and i'm like uh. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so now I move up and we're talking, we're laughing. There's another group over here talking about others, other comic books and other stuff. And this group is talking about this and this group's talking about this. And I'm sitting there going, this young man organized this whole thing. Cause the teacher was telling me, all she did was say, you can use my room. And he literally did all the rest. That's so funny. tomorrow we got to go get the thank you card. Um, I signed his yearbook. He's a junior. So I told him, I'll see you next year at graduation. I'm definitely going to graduation. Give my personal email. You want to stay in touch? He'll send me clips about this musician. And I'll say, have you heard of this? And that's more than any money can buy. It sure is. Oh, my God. That's that's, that's fantastic. Tremendous. That's tremendous. How can we inspire and encourage children to have a love of learning? Um, the easy answer is make it fun, but it sounds... Like, make it fun. Well, what's that mean? Make it interesting. Make it relatable, right? Mm -hmm. So because we teach history, a lot of times we get caught up in what was in the past. So what I did th this year in Africana was I started, I said, okay, here's where we are now. And we started with Black Lives Matter. And then the rest of it was all year long to how did we get to where we started? Mm. He said, that's how. I said, so that if you look at the story of African Americans in this country, it's one of the most historic, heroic stories in the world. To mm. go from twelve generations of slavery to nine generations of freedom, and all that's been accomplished with sustained pushback at the most crucial points, it's a hero story. But you have to frame it in a way that they can get it and appreciate it, and then give them the skills so that they can. Because I always tell them. You'll learn more when you leave here mm -hmm. than you did here because you'll be able to look at and read things that you want to, right? right. So instead of things that you have to do, but again, th there are things in life you're going to have to do. But once you do, if you do the things you have to do, you can do the things you want to do. Yes. So it's all about, to me, it's all how do we get them to love learning is make it interesting. And it sounds easier than it actually is. Yeah, that's so true. But it can be done. show them the relevancy. Here's why what happened 100 years ago is important. Yeah. Here's why what happened 50 years ago is important. And the thing that I do is I use myself as an example. I was born in 1956, right? So in 1956, my parents are wondering where am I? Where is their son going to go to school? Brown had was two years old. There's still resistance. Uh -huh. By the time we get to 1968, Dr. King's assassination, I'm 12. Yeah. Right. In my lifetime. First black president in my lifetime. So I use myself as an example. All that, right. oh, there's yes. all this, all that makes it real to them. Yes. Right? This isn't just some stuff in a book. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, within my lifetime, I have seen this. Yeah. And and that's the way I always approached it. And apparently it had there was some it resonated with some because we have uh Young Desi who's commenting. Yeah. But that but that is that is you know, as as Desi said, that is so true. Um making it relevant. I remember one time teaching a class, and actually I think I was teaching the black history class back in the day. Um uh, and and I like to talk about the music that came out mm. of the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were talking about something and somebody asked about um what's on Martin Luther King's um, tomb that it says, you know, free at last. Free. And I said, well, do you know where that comes from? I said, that's an old hymn. Mm. And they're like, really? Mm. So I had, so the next class I had the CD and we started listening to those hymns and we started looking at the history behind those hymns yeah. and what they meant. And they like, I never knew that. I said, yeah, this, that wasn't him saying that wasn't random. Right. That's right. That's right. It wasn't random. That's right. There was something behind that. I said, with mm -hmm. him being being a preacher, I said that was part of who he was. Yeah. So I would always try to find, you know, for me, history 
you know, like you said, make it, make it fun, make it interesting but, and make it relevant and find those, those pieces where kids can grasp onto it. So if it's, if it's the music of the era, mm-hmm. if it's the clothing of the era, there's yeah. a reason why they wore those clothes. There's That's a right. reason why this happened. So bring those pieces in because then it makes so much more sense to them because you can get up there and teach history and make it dead as can be. That's right. That's right. That's and, right. That's and a that I knew. Point. I knew when I was boring myself. Yeah, that you I was tell. boring my students. Yeah, you could just tell. And that's well, the yeah. other thing about teaching that you can read a room, and you can say, "All right, put this down, put this away, and we're gonna on a dime, we're gonna go to this," right. um, because you might get an idea. We, um, I used to do this. I used to play the song of the day. So I would start with a song. So I'd play a variety of things. I'd play um, Sam Cooke's. Um, uh, a change is going to come. Mm-hmm. I'd play that. I'd play something new and I'd give him the lyric. I'd play Marvin Gaye because, you know, you got to play some oh, Marvin God, Gaye. Oh, God, yes. What's and, going on? Um, yes. In fact, I did it, to, I did it this year. I played, I, we talked about um, Inner City Blues. And I would oh, say, yeah, okay, yeah. We, here's the song, here's the lyric. What's he singing about? Give me five things he's talking about. And then of those five things, is there anything he's talking about that is still applicable today? This is going to hurt both of us 50 years later. Yes. And there it was. There mm-hmm. it was. And so, one, it put them onto that. Oh, my grandfather liked that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Of course they did. Now you like it. And then, but the but the subject matter. So yes. there was a cool way for them to learn about, about you know, the, the issues of today aren't just the issues of today. They're the issues of yesterday, of yesteryear. Mm-hmm. And so that's, again, one of those ways to make it interesting. Yeah. Because like you said, cool. you can stand up there and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. Yep. And it's dreadful, you know, that's and you know when it's way. dreadful. And that's why you we turn on to those other things. Yeah. So, oh, Debelina says it makes sense and she's wanted to thank you. And it says it was inspiring to hear you share your experience this evening. Thank you so much. So one of the things I always like to do is ask folks about a book that was of interest to them. And the book that you chose was 400 Souls, which is edited by Ibram Kendi and Keisha Blaine. And this is it right here. Mine is right over there. Okay. <laughs> and this is, um, at when you and when you did that, I remember when I read this, I said, why didn't I have this when I was teaching history? Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. It's, it's like you hit every... You talk about a roller coaster of emotions. You hit everything when you read this book. And I remember saying, but you know what? Here's the weird thing about this book. When I finished reading it, you know what really got me? Reading the footnotes, reading the appendix. Oh, yeah. About all the contributors. Yes. And learning about them. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. This person did. They wrote what? They did what? Mm -hmm. I found that just as fascinating reading about the contributors as I did reading about what they wrote. Tremendous. Tremendous. But it's one of those books. So, folks, if you have not read 400 Souls, um, which is edited by Ibram Kendi and Keisha Blaine, you really need to do the subtitle is A Community History of African American 1619 to 2019. And they break it up into those time segments. And it's really, really interesting. Really yes. interesting. It is. So, did you have a? So, what it? So, after you finished reading it, what were your initial thoughts about it? Um, all the stuff that I wanted to tell them, my students. Oh. All the stuff I wanted to tell them. Um, a lot of things that verified what I had always believed. Um, and it just, again, that overcoming story. That story of. You came from 12 generations of slavery and in the face of sustained resistance have achieved this. There's so much more to go, so much further to go, but no one can take away what you, what we as a people have accomplished. Right. Have accomplished. You know, and in fact, this year, when I started the year, we started with the census, started with the census. Mm. And I asked them, so what percentage do you think uh, of the country is African-American? And you'd get like 30%. 40 percent. OK, so let's go to the census. Right. The most recent census, 11.9 percent. Mm. Right. And the and those who self-identify now as biracial is increasing. Yes. And so when you look at it, it was in a bar graph and you look at it, 
the country's changing. Yes. And so that's how I started. And so as a result of the country changing, this is why you're seeing what you're seeing. Mm. Because all those things that we knew 30 years ago that were going to happen in terms of demographics are beginning to happen. And that's right. why you get the sustained pushback against it. But the genie's out of the bottle. So now we've got to figure out who's going to be co-opted to join the majority and try to maintain this, this thing. Or we're going to just do minority rule. But, yeah. but I started with just to let them know that all this, all this blowback and pushback has literally been to 12% of the population. That's it. Right. So 12% of the population can't be 100% of the problem. So if you start with that premise and then go backwards and now come full circle. So when they left, they were like, wow, oh, okay. And that did my heart good because I, I, I promised them. I said, look, at the end of the year, you're going to understand why we're here. And then mm. we just went like this and came back. Yeah. I love that idea of starting with the census. I love what you just said. 12% of the people cannot be 100% of the problem. Can't be. Can't be. Uh, convenient scapegoats. Convenient yes. scapegoats. Because you can sell anybody anything if you have a convenient scapegoat. Sure can. I'm going to miss that so much. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You're going to be talking to yourself, Richard. <laughs> I'm going to be talking to myself. I'm going to be talking to the missus. I'm going to be talking to the trees. Anybody who will listen, <laughs> because I can't imagine not doing this. Yeah. But I'm not going to do it. So it's, but again, I, I, I said, like, as, as I said earlier, I ha when your life exceeds your dreams, you're lucky. I've been incredibly, I'm not working really hard at it, but I have been incredibly lucky in being able to do something I love for the amount of time that uh, that I was able to, and um, to send out all those young minds who I still will see or hear from from time to time, and and some of the things I said resonated, and yeah. you can't beat that. How do you beat that? I can't, and I can't even self depreciate that. Like sometimes, oh no, no, no. But now I have to say, you know, right. yeah, yeah, you you've done well. Yes. You've sent young people out. I saw a guy at, a bar at the barber shop a, a while ago, and he's talking about. I tell my sons the same, some of the same stuff you told me. These two young, uh, these two young women who tracked me down in school this year to sign their yearbooks. I had them as freshmen, and I shook their hand. Congratulations! And they said, "I remember when you when you taught us when you shake somebody's hand, give them a firm handshake, and look them in the eyes." <laughs> and I'm like, "And you're doing it to me now, right? Yes, I am." Right. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, it's and it goes beyond the subject matter. Right. It, that's, a that's a life yes. thing. That's a life thing. Last year's uh, valedictorian, uh, um, I wasn't there, but last year's valedictorian, I used to do this thing about time. And I'd say, time goes by really fast, right? It goes, <sighs> the valedict, so I, I got a text from the graduation. The valedictorian just did your finger snap thing. <laughs> And that's one of those things you just think up in the moment. And yeah. you just go, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's how fast it goes. And so now there's a bunch of kids out there who remember that. Yes. So I always tell them, whatever, think of your favorite song. Whatever your favorite song is, think of your favorite song, right? And then, oh, you're thinking it now, huh? Because I can tell mm -hmm. you, it, right? Okay, yeah. good. Now, think of your favorite song. And guess what? Right next to your favorite song, in whatever part of your brain your favorite song is, is my voice. Yes. <laughs> because one of the reasons why I did this was it sounds ridiculous now, but it was true. I wanted to live forever. I wanted to live forever. And I've been doing this long enough to know that my voice is in young people's heads. Yeah. And it will be there. And when they need it, it'll be there. And sometimes when they don't want it to be, it'll be, oh, yeah, he said, now I know what he meant. Now, I, oh my, God. and that's what I wanted. I wanted to yeah. live forever. Yeah. So Ooh, we have this great comment from Desi. And Desi, I just wanted to also recognize that when you said that you will be um, working towards your school counseling degree and you'll be done in May 2024, keep going, keep strong, because mm -hmm. Lord knows we need you out there. So congratulations on making that move. Wow, yeah. This so this, yeah. This is tremendous. This yeah. is it's yeah. hero's work. Teaching is hero's work. I it tell is. my classes, I tell people who want to teach, I tell teachers already, this is hero's work. 
It's hero's work. Yeah, that is so, so true. So, so true. Richard, this has been, I don't know, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Beyond fantastic. I, I mean, Thank I'm you. always inspired by you um, all these years later, um, even when, you know, I'm not sitting outside your classroom listening to you. <laughs> but think about it. I mean, I, I retired from EP in 2008, and I still carry with me hearing you. Oh, my God. Teach. That's great. Thank you. And it just, and and there are times I talk about you to people and I'm saying, oh, his ears are probably burning. <laughs> uh, because you're such That's a great, great, you know, you're not, a, you're not, I, you're, you're beyond a role model. You're wow. beyond, a, saying you're just a role model is, is not enough. Wow. That's you, know, really nice. you are, I don't know, you're one of those superheroes that you like so much. That's right. That's History, your man. That's your <laughs> teaching is your superpower. That's my superpower. That that absolutely is. Your superpower. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I I just like to say one more thing to anybody who's who's listening. Um, I, and I told this to my those students at this at this event. I said if you can find a job where you have, you can have as much fun as I have had in mine, you will be extremely fortunate because I have had a blast. I, I can count the bad days on one hand, yeah. one hand, because in teaching you have the ability to change that bad day in, into a good day. You do. Just by, just by shifting gears, changing course, doing that. You can, you can flip it. It doesn't have to be the whole day in teaching five classes. All right. So first period didn't go well. I'll get them tomorrow. Second period. Oh, it's better. Third period. Oh, it's better. Yeah. Fourth period. So you had time to kind of, mm -hmm. to kind of flip it around where um, some other jobs didn't allow you to do that. Right. But I have had a tremendous, tremendous time. Well, I appreciate you. And I know you. your students over the years have appreciated you. Their parents have appreciated you. you. Your, your colleagues have appreciated you because um, like you said, your, your voice is always going to be there. Your voice is always going to be there for those students. They're going to be passing on those lessons to their kids. And then their kids are going to be passing on to their kids. And, you know, and you, you know, you just left us such a legacy. You can't beat it with a, a stick. Legacy. You can't beat it with a stick. I've been very, very lucky. Yeah. Very lucky. But like I said, I didn't think I would retire before Rod Stewart retired. <laughs> That's the way it is. So, I'm so so maybe now Rod Stewart will retire. I mean, uh, Richard Martin retires. So I guess I gotta go. <laughs> I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him in April, and it's the last time for one of us. Um, oh my in, uh, August. It's the last time for one of us has to say no. One <laughs> of us has to say no. So, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. For oh, the thank you so much. And, uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. You too, and thank you everyone that joined in. Thank you for commenting. I really appreciate it. Yeah. For those of you that are watching this on the replay. Um, still throw your comments in there because we definitely would like to hear what you're thinking. And if you're considering a job in education, you know, really seriously consider it because we need people out there in the classrooms who are willing to be vulnerable and create those relationships with their students. That, that's what we need. We need that human touch and, and we need teachers because without teachers, nothing else is going to happen. That's right. Nothing Absolutely. else is going to happen in this world. Well, so. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, I will see you next Monday. Um, and take care. And uh, Mr. Martin, hang in there. Okay. Um, so we have one last comment. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can get it up here. Whoops. There we go. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very and much. Then, and then one more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So we thank you everyone for joining in. And as I said, we hope to, I hope to see you next week. And, and who knows, we may be reading, I don't know, Mr. Martin, we know he's going to be out there doing something fabulous. <laughs> so we just have to keep, keep our, keep our ear to the ground to hear about what he's doing next and, and his, and his next hustle, his next side hustle, as That's we were right. talking earlier. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Take care, everyone. This has been Dr. B from Steps to the Future coming to you at College and Career Conversations. And our guest this evening was Richard Martin, who recently retired from the East Providence School District as a social studies teacher. So again, see you next week. <laughs>